Thank you for joining me this week for my last weekly live session from the Barn Theatre. I hope to continue these sessions on a monthly basis from now on. The first session was held on the 21st of March at the very beginning of the lockdown and I've been joined each week by a panel of experts to discuss the latest COVID-19 policy. But now we need to discuss the next steps. I would like to thank everyone who has joined me over the past couple of months for their insight and to help answer the questions sent in by you. I would also like to pay a tremendous thanks to the team here at the barn who have done an incredibly good job and worked hard to provide informative and entertaining content for our community throughout this period of lockdown. So from the 4th of July, thousands of pubs, restaurants and hairdressers will be able to reopen their doors, provided they are COVID-19 secure and follow the guidance that we have given to them to reduce the risk of spreading the virus. This pandemic has been especially hard for our hospitality sectors and the government has been working with businesses and representative groups and trade unions on guidance to enable them to reopen as quickly and as safely as possible. To help boost our economic recovery, the government is introducing the ne next week a new business and planning bill into the Commons that will simplify licensing processes and cut red tape for thousands of pubs and restaurants and cafes. It will introduce a fresco, al fresco dining to the county to the country by allowing them to serve customers outside and increasing outdoor street trading and other outdoor markets. So this week I am joined by a panel of experts from the hospitality and leisure industry who all have tremendous insight into the challenges facing this sector and what the opening on the 4th of July will look like. So the panelists this week are, and I welcome them all, are Mark Thomas, MD of Orion Holidays, Rob Goves, Director of Relish, Jason Myers, Founder and Chairman of Grosvenor Pubs, Aidan Stevens, Owner of the Stratton House Hotel, and last but by no means least, we always have one person in the studio and today it's Rupert Mackenzie Hill, Founder and CEO of Ki Ki Kiss Gyms. Rupert, you're very welcome. We look forward to hearing more about Kiss Gyms in a minute. The two-week application window for the discretionary business grants closed on Sunday the 14th of June and the Cotswold District Council received 341 applications. Payments to those businesses that qualified will be paid today. The payment awards use the maximum sum made available by the government totalling £1,711,000. However, as all the funds have been allocated, Unfortunately, there is no appeal process. This week, the Public Accounts Committee, of which I am Deputy Chairman, had a major public inquiry onto readying the NHS and social care for the COVID-19 peak. During the inquiry, I questioned senior health officials on their decision to discharge patients into care homes when at the beginning of April, there were already a thousand care homes with cases of coronavirus. I raised the fact that detailed advice on dealing with the virus was not provided to the care sector until the 15th of April, almost a month after the equivalent information was provided to the NHS. The inquiry has received considerable coverage and I've been interviewed by a number of media outlets, including Parliament Today and The Times. No doubt, there are significant lessons to be learned from this period. David, over to you. Thank you, Sir Geoffrey, and um, thank you again to everybody at the barn. And I think a big thank you to you, Sir Geoffrey. No one ever thanks you, but you've done a fantastic job thank answering you. nearly 400 questions. And I've got a few today a bit later on. We're going to show two very quick videos to set the scene um, for businesses in the north and the south who are about to reopen uh, in just over a week's time, and then hand back to you, Sir Geoffrey, to go straight into the question time panel. Can we play the videos, please? Hello, and I'm at the King's Arms Inn in Mickleton with the landlord, Mike Tayara. Mike, how long have you been at the King's Arms? Well, we've been here uh, for the last 17 years. 17 years. I know you've built up a really great reputation, yeah. a great community pub, but also for great food. So, in March, along came the lockdown. 
What did you do, Mike? Well, it was a shock in the beginning, but then we started doing takeaways. We had time to refurbish the buildings and we started doing the garden in the hope that the summer would stay as it started. So did you get some support from the government to help you through that lockdown period? Uh, without the sub government support, we would have been shut down by now. Okay, now I, I know for one that your takeouts, the Friday night fish and chips, they're absolutely great, Mike, and um, we've thoroughly enjoyed them, and I know many people will have done so as well. Now, come July the 4th, what's the plans now for the King's Arms? Well, we, we, we're going to keep doing the takeaways because it was so successful. We built the bar in the gardens, so now it's completely separate from the inside. So people who want to stay and enjoy the sun in the garden, it's open for them. There is a bar, there is a food, there is a kitchen open and we're open and we can't wait to reopen and welcoming most of the, our friends again. And I know that a lot of local people can't wait either. We need our village pubs back and in particular we need the great food that places like Mike and a lot of other places though around the North Cotswold serve. So good luck Mike when this reopens. We can't wait to be back. Thank you. Thank you for coming here too. Thank you. So earlier this week, the government announced that a number of businesses can reopen as of the 4th of July. Uh, so I'm in Tetbury in the surrounding area and I'm going to go and meet uh, three business owners to see how they feel about reopening and also what they're going to do to keep their staff safe and also their customers safe. Got sort of like mixed feelings about it, really. Um, but yeah, I've uh, definitely been eager to get back and start cutting hair again. I really enjoy my job and I love speaking to people, so the social aspect of it, yeah, seeing people regularly, day in, day out, uh, and just getting their feelings as well is quite, it's quite reassuring for myself. So, um, yeah, I definitely miss that. Uh, and obviously the, the job itself, cutting hair. Um, but then, I don't know, I've, I feel as if there's slight hurried sort of feeling about the releasing of the different phases and as we've been going forward, I don't feel like they're has been such a plan uh, and I, yeah I'd like there to be a bit more like structure to it or, or more clear guidelines I think we've obviously been given guidelines um, we've given like, leaflets from the local council saying sort of like a checklist almost to go through um, but it just feels a bit yeah slapdash really so we've uh, changed to exclusively just bookings now which um, yeah, so I already had a booking system that I would do sort of like evenings and weekends. So we've just moved that into the full time that we're working. So that there'll be no sort of like queuing in the waiting area. There's no build up of customers. We've uh, we've got our own visors, masks, gloves. See, constantly going to be using sanitizer. We disinfect all our equipment. We're doing that more regularly. So uh, in between every client, as opposed to every day, uh, each customer will have a new gown. So that will then be all washed and restarted the next day. Uh, and then, yeah, just advising people to um, wait outside until they're sort of called in. Um, not going to have any sort of build up of people. Um, and yeah. Okay, so we are a, a good food pub with two Sordes Awards. We've got uh, bedrooms upstairs above the pub, glamping, camping, chalets, we host events, like weddings, we've got a fantastic outside bar. We all have also got a lovely garden where we grow a lot of our own fruit and veg and also a little bit of our booze. I think like everybody, but as soon as we got the, the information to lock down, it was a big shock to everyone, but I think a lot of us got put on furlough and we just shut the doors and we deliberated over doing takeaways or not, but we thought we'd just be too tricky to do because we weren't set up for it here. So we all just kind of sat down, went on furlough, but then very quickly got uh, a little bit agitated and wanted to get back uh, to business. So we've been doing a lot of improvements. We've been building some luxury chalets in the garden. I've spent time uh, learning how to do some gardening and uh, learn some skills that I've not learned before. But in terms of the rest of the team, we've just been trying to get this place looking good. Lots of improvements um, to make the experience a lot better for people when we eventually did reopen, which is pretty soon. I think like a lot of people, we're really excited. Um, I think there's a lot of things we've had to overcome, but yeah, I think ultimately we are just excited to get back and going and hopefully have some kind of summer. 
Okay, of course, so our number one priority is the safety of our staff and customers. Um, we've, we've put a lot of time and thought into this. We've had quite a little bit of time on our hands to do so. Uh, we're very fortunate that we're a large outdoor venue. We've got a large outdoor garden space, so social distancing outside will be really easy for us. But we've also implemented a one-way system and lots of signage and PPE, ultimately, to keep our staff safe going forward. fantastic to be reopening. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. You know, we've been, we've been watching the news every week. Uh, what's happening, what's Boris going to say, what are the numbers like everybody else has. It's been really weird, but we're coming out the other end, so we're just really happy and ready to go now because we've been, we're not used to having this much time off. In this business, you never get time off. We have January for a couple of weeks. You're always doing something, you're always busy doing something. So to, to actually get started, to have, I mean, the new beer garden, we've done it because we figure we can't get as many people in the pub, of course. You know, social distancing, one and a half metre rule or one plus rule. So the chickens have been evicted. They used to live here. Um, we've put some more, more lawn down. We've got new tables, new chairs. Spending some money, it's not been cheap, um, but we've had some help from the government. That's been great. The, uh, the grant we got from the, we got ultimately from the council. On, really, has and it allowed us to invest in, in the pub. And so rather than feel sorry for ourselves, at first it was, Oh God. And then we got we got the, the support that we needed from the government, thank you. So we just run with it really. Um, Fantastic. That's where we've we ordered are. everything we need for um, safety inside the building, which is arriving in a few days, so we can take out a few tables. Luckily we never had tables close together anyway, so it's literally losing a couple of tables. We have all the arrows on the floor and the um, sanitizer everywhere and we're developing a go in the front way, come out the back and do it in a big loop. So, so a big one-way system like you see in other places. So um, We're lucky, the building's big. As Lynn said, we don't have that many tables. No. We, we've always operated like that. We don't like to be squashed in. Yeah. Our B&B rooms are all self-contained with their own en suites and they face out into the car park so there's no passageways. So they're fine anyway. I'd imagine people can still come and have nice holidays here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, there you are, some really enterprising businesses with good ideas, um, how they're going to reopen their businesses on Saturday week, on the 4th of July, and try and keep us as safe as they possibly can. And I'm here with a, a great panel to try and discuss that theme a little bit more, in, in more detail, and also uh, with, unfortunately, one of the businesses, Rupert, who's here with me in the studio, uh, gyms who are not allowed to open, reopen yet, but uh, we'll be discussing that. So to introduce you to the panel, and I haven't yet um, been able to see them, so let's uh, see if we can get them up on screen. I think we have Mark. Mark. Hi. Hi, Mark. You're very welcome. You're MD of Orion Holidays. Just tell our audience very briefly, by way of introduction, what this uh, relaxation of the lockdown could mean to you. Um, well, we, uh, we just stopped, like a lot of other businesses, when the lockdown happened in March. And although we've been busy dealing with uh, postponed bookings and the like, it, it's, it's been... It's been a shame because we've been flat out doing stuff that actually will not earning us any money so we haven't had any guests in at all. Um, and we're looking forward now to starting again on the 4th of July. But unfortunately, that period is gone. It's time. We can't have it back. Um, so we're going to be working for several years, I'd say. I don't know how many years yet to try and recover from this one, actually. But with the government help, I have to say, the following... It has been bearable. I, I I'm going to stop you there, Mark. Unfortunately, we've got a little bit of problem with your sound. I'm going to let perhaps okay. the technical people talk to you and just move. But I will, of course, we'll come back to you. I'm then going to okay. move to, to Rob. Rob Goves, Director of Relish. Rob, hello, Rob. Can you hear me? Oh dear. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you just pop your hand up so we can see you, Rob? Yeah, Hello. brilliant. Hello. Okay. Um, now, your director, Relish, again, could you very briefly introduce your business and, uh, and how this change is going to help you? Um, so, our business is um, roughly split into two parts one part being our event catering, and the other half being the venues and locations that we uh, own and operate around the Cotswolds. 
the, the majority of which actually have been operating as takeaways for a number of weeks now, quite successfully, which has been really encouraging. And it's been a fabulous team effort by all the you know terrific staff who work in our locations to get those businesses working uh, as takeaway operations. And I'm sat here on the glorious lake at the Gateway Cafe and Information Center, which has been particularly busy over the last few weeks as a result of all the glorious weather we've had. Um, and I think it's really lovely to hear some of those stories from other pubs who've diversified and spent the money and the time um, developing their outside spaces and looking at more entrepreneurial ways of generating revenue within their current businesses. And whilst we have the weather, that's brilliant. However, you know, we do need to <laughs> consider that this is uh, England and, you know, Great Britain and the weather's not always as okay. lovely as it's been. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there, um, uh, Rob, um, uh, and we'll come back to you, but I want to get the other two in first just to introduce them to our audience. So, uh, Jason uh, Myers, you're founder and chairman of Grosvenor Pubs. Tell us what this, uh, wh what your business is, basically, and what this is going to mean to you. Yeah, I think, obviously, I'm, uh, we, we invest in independent businesses, so we've uh, got five country pubs. Uh, we've got uh, the Crown at uh, Ampton Cruises, which we're delighted with. Um, we've got um, other businesses across the UK, and we've got 17 award-winning restaurants in the centre of London. So uh, different challenges um, across the south of England in different ways. Uh, really concerned about our Zone 1 restaurant business in London. I think that's many, many challenges uh, to face going forward because many of these uh, properties are much smaller than a large country pub or any of the assets that we've seen on the videos today, uh, which throws a lot of different challenges. There's a huge challenge with the landlord situation, um, which is brewing. And I think Rob touched on it there about, um, and Mark, about the future of, of the length yeah, of we'll, time we'll, we'll on, we'll on recovery. On we'll come on to that, uh, Jason, in, in a little while. And, and finally, I'd like to get in um, Aidan. Aidan, you, you're, you're just down the road at the Stratton House. Um, tell us about your hotel. Yeah, so, uh, we, yeah, we're uh, based uh, just, just outside the Sarasota uh, Town Centre. We've got uh, 44 bedrooms. Um, we uh, bought, bought the property back in 2016 and have refurbished it very extensively. Um, to, the, to the back of the property, we actually have roughly about an acre of garden space. And hopefully, you know, finance is permitting in the, in the next year or so, we're looking to add a spa onto the side of the hotel to make it much more of a destination hotel. Um, you know, obviously, look, looking looking back over the last three months, um, you know, it's been been very evident that um, the nature of hospitality will will have to change. I mean, for, for each of us, you know, we we each run very individual businesses, um, but looking ahead, it's, it's very clear that sort of outside space can become the the big opportunity for the next twelve to eighteen months. So, the last the last uh, month or so, we've we've been uh, investing heavily in terms of outside heatings, you know, smartening up the garden looking to, to really make much more of the, uh, the outside space, which I think for us will be a massive opportunity in the, uh, in the months, months Rick, ahead. I, I, wanted, I wanted to discuss the, the, the future of all your businesses in detail, so I'm not going to dwell on that at the moment. And then finally, but by no means least, I'm joined here in the studio by Rupert uh, Mackenzie Hill. Now, he's founder and CEO of Kiss Gyms. That's uh, intrigued me as to what, right. how many gyms you've got, um, but what, unfortunately, with this lockdown, you're not going to be able to do. No, we're not, Geoffrey. We, um, so we've got three gyms to answer the first question. The, the closest one is in Swindon, uh, and then one in London and one in Milton Keynes. Um, but no, unfortunately, under this latest announcement, we are biding our time. Um, but we have had plenty of time to think about how we're going to open, and, and I'd love to tell you about the preparations we've made. But, um, so. Well, we'll come on to that. Yeah. Um, uh, we come on to that. Um, uh, so uh, perhaps I'm going to try uh, back uh, with you, uh, Mark, and just see if our sound is, 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 is uh, um, up and running uh, now. Um, just okay. tell us... Sorry? Yeah, I just said OK. Can you hear uh, me OK? So, so, sounds as though we're good, actually. I can hear you quite well now. So I now would like to move on to the sort of next theme, as it were, in this, these questions and ask you all, but ask you first, Mark, give you the first divvy as you had troubles last time. Um, uh, what, what, what is this change going to do for your business? How are you going to operate going forward? Well, that's what 
we've been uh, thinking about over the last well, both months since we've been shut. But the frustration, which I know we'll talk about later as well, is, is the, the lack of information and, and the lack of planning time. But basically, we will be going back, I think, pretty much as we were before, but with intense cleaning and sanitising involved. Luckily, because of what we're doing, self-catering properties, we haven't got the outside spaces to worry about particularly. So it's just a matter of how we get the people into the property safely and make sure the properties are cleaned correctly and are safe for them to go into. And obviously for the cleaners and all the staff that will also have to enter them. So we've got the protocols in place, we've done our risk assessment. We're pretty much, we've done what we can do, so we're now just waiting for the day to come. And you've done your risk assessment. Do you then get some sort of, do you, do you advertise yourself as a sort of COVID safe business? I'm, I'm intrigued by this. Well, there is, there are some, there's an AA accreditation we can have and another one, I think, Visit England. Um, they rely very much on us having produced a risk assessment, but it appears to us that the government, thankfully, <laughs> have not tried to give us too much guidance specifically on cleaning and preparation. I think they've left it sensibly with the industry to do a proper risk assessment and say look this is how we're going to handle it some people have gone i think a little bit over the top of the fogging and we are not doing that but we were always pretty good at cleaning anyway but using other bacteria other uh, mark I'm, I'm afraid your it must be your internet connection i think um, yeah, i think it might be yeah okay well uh, it sort of starts off all right perhaps the internet yeah. is telling us that we need brief uh, replies from you because it starts all right, okay. off all right and then <laughs> Uh, Rob, um, okay. let's go to you. Uh, um, uh, uh, going forward, I, I mean, how, how is this sort of relaxation of the regulations going to affect your business? Um, we, we're just working through all of the, you know, documentation that's been provided in terms of guidance, making sure that we've got all of our risk assessments in place and that our staff are safe. But really, we're just trying to be as agile as we can as we reopen other spaces within our locations. Um, so that um, so that we can make the best possible use of, of, of the assets that we have. And then further to the events business that I mentioned earlier, because obviously we have no events and probably for still quite some time to come, we've just changed what we do. So we've launched Relish Online, which is where people can buy pretty much all of our catering products delivered to their holiday homes or delivered to um you know a marquee if they're having a small gathering of 30 people they can have all of their food just dropped off and off they go so we're just we're just changing our products around that sounds a great service it really does well and what, what we're seeing of course is from all of you is this, this sort of great entrepreneurism how to deal with your business to the best effect during these circumstances so uh, that is it's great to see it really is jason uh, you're your your founder and chairman of grosvenor pubs um, going forward, um, I mean, how are you going to sort of run these pubs safely? We've heard a great deal about being able to operate outside, but presumably, will people be able to come into the pub but on a socially distanced basis, or how is that going to work? Because presumably, are you going to deliver their, their beer or whatever to, to outside, or are they going to come in and be served and then take it outside? How's it all going to work? Okay, so Jeffrey, I think I wish um, we had time and I would actually physically take you around the uh, pub I'm in today so I could show you how it works. We've had, um, we've had uh, our audit company, we've got an independent business that we work with called Shawfoot, who've taken the government guidelines. I think Mark made a really relevant point. I'm really relieved to see that the government's treat tra us as grown ups and it's allowed us to. Um, uh, you know, we are specialists in hygiene within our sector and what we do. We know how to get ready. So we, we've had a massive week this week uh, getting all our businesses uh, up to standard directional signage. So in answer to your question, uh, you have a one way in, a one way out system. You have directional signage around the property. It's all sit down at a table. There's no vertical drinking at the bar. Um, albeit it's fairly grey is that area, but that's what we've adopted. I think what we've got to be really careful to be is that we don't look like you're coming into a operating theatre. And um, I was relieved to see there's some flexibility in the guidance on that. So all of our businesses, Sir Jeffrey, have been audited this week. They've all been passed. Uh, there isn't formal accreditation, but there is trade bodies saying, um, if you do this, you, they'll put a sign up saying we have been COVID approved. So our signage has gone up. We'll be ready for the 4th of July. Like Rob, um, like many people on the call, we've totally readapted to the market 
we are a resilient function hospitality. We've been doing takeaways, we've been doing deliveries, uh, we've been doing free grocery boxes, we've been doing whatever it takes to stay in business. So, but now, you know, there's a lot of work. We've talked about the outside. Yes, we've also invested heavily. I think a couple of the guys have touched on this to get your property ready to be able to serve customers inside. And outside has took a real big amount of investment and time and effort to get these assets up, up, up and running. And the bigger challenge is how many colleagues will have left from furlough yeah. to be able to come back to the asset. How many has gone abroad? So massive effort. And, and that's what we're doing. Brilliant. Um, I, I want to understand from all of you, but I'm just going to bring in um, uh, uh, Aiden first. Um, and just ask, you know, how you're going to organise your hotel because you've got, um, and I've been to the hotel many times, you've got the outdoor facility, you've got a big uh, sort of common area where you serve tea and that sort of thing, you've got the bar area and you've got the dining room and then you've got your bedrooms. So how are you going to make sure that people are uh, keeping safe as far as possible with all those different facilities? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so the... The massive advantage that we have in comparison to a lot of other businesses is that with us, with our footprint being so big, we're actually hugely fortunate in that we can actually fill most of the bedrooms and still actually have more than more than ample space in order to kind of fit everyone in. So we we will obviously be, be shuffling how things are, are done so that you know in the lounge, for example, all the all the seating is already two meters apart. So in reality, there's not much of a change there. The garden again, all the tables are two meters apart. So we're sort of fairly lucky in terms of where, where we're sort of coming from in, in terms of the basics. Um, however, we then have to be much more sort of diligent around how the teams work and operate and work together. So in terms of sort of each of the different departments within the within the hotel, um, we're actually working very, very hard to really make sure that there is there is almost no overlap at all. So the, the chefs will have their own their own access into the kitchen and out of the building again. And literally, you know, they, they will actually have almost no human contact other than passing food over at the past whereby, you know, they'll they'll sort of step forward, hand the plate over, step back, and then literally whoever's serving the food will be able to sort of take it and you know they'll they'll be able to stay two meters apart the whole time. In so terms of front of house I'm going to throw a question out to all four of you, and then I'm going to come in to, to Rupert and, t and talk about Jim's. But to all four of you, I think our listeners will be very keen to understand, are they in your establishments going to be able to go up to the bar and collect their drinks and then take them to a table, or take them outside, or is that going to be strictly prohibited in all of your businesses? They will have to go and take a seat, and then they will be served with their drinks or their meal. Anyone who wants to come in on that, happy to take your answer. Who's, who's got an answer on that? Uh, Rob, have you, have you, I mean, how are you going to deal with, with your various facilities? Well, people aren't going to be allowed to come up to any counters and, uh, and order. Everything will be either done via um, our POS system, which allows for online ordering, or it'll be table side handheld orders taken by a member of staff who's got the correct kind of protective gear in place. Yeah, there won't be anyone coming up to any bars just just yet. Um, so, and we're actually working with a very, very clever company called Fenetica, who've developed a, a sort of biometric widget, which they do, they do big airports and all sorts of tannoy bits and bobs for, for big um, outside spaces, but they've developed a very small little widget that you can put in a restaurant that um, will count people in, count people out. It links with an app so that you can gather data for, for the track and trace, um, um, initiative and um, it does all sorts of other clever things as well like it monitors heat patterns and keeps people separate sets of alarms you can predetermine the number of people allowed in the premises it's called Fenetica I'll share it with the show afterwards if you want to have a look at it it's very Fantastic. very clever so are any of you you've I've seen on the television pe pe people have uh, got clever ways of ordering their drinks and 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 their meals through their telephone are, are any of you using anything like that to save the extra job of the wait uh, waitress having to go to a table getting close to people it just could be the order could be taken remotely on a telephone are any of you using anything like that yes uh, you Jason uh, yes, so Jeffrey, we've got um, a smartphone app system that we've built um, that you can do that. You can order. We're using it now for takeaways because uh, we've got um, a huge park opposite uh, uh, one of the pubs. So people come here, they can order the takeaway. They can collect it from a safe point. 
Um, going back on your last question around can you order at bars, I think we have built an outside bar for the 4th of July and will be queuing system with an appropriate marked out distance with a one in and one out. So you see is that within the venues, um, we've opted with no queuing. It will be fully table service. We we'll also remember probably uh, running the inside outlets with 40% less covers as well. And then outside, we've created a dedicated area with appropriately spaced out areas. So queuing bar system where you can get a drink outside in a much safer environment. So you've got to factor in all your environmentals I think when you're coming up with your risk assessment and that's what we've chosen to do. Thank you, Mark. I mean, your business is slightly different in, in its sort of holiday homes, but that's got its own challenges, hasn't it? You've been given lots of guidance by the government, by your trade association, that a lot of things have got to be removed from the holiday homes. Just tell us about some of the... I mean, you know, people will be looking on your website now and thinking, well, how is he going to keep these holiday homes COVID safe? Tell us about a little bit about some of the precautions you're taking. Well, the recommendations and what we're doing is, is taking out all, like you said, the board games, the DVDs, the anything we've got that's that's small and could be transmitting and, and you know cause any cross contamination. We've got soft furnishings, as in rugs, and we've got cushions. We are we're going to take them all out and uh, basically make it as comfortable still as possible, clearly, but as um, safe as possible as well. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to um, come to Rupert now. Yes. Rupert, and, and you've been sitting there very quietly and very patiently, right. particularly as you're going to be in a really difficult position. You can't open, can you, on the 4th of July? Do you want to explain no. to our visitors why that is? Um, I mean, the assumption is that um, we're considered to be, you know, less safe. Um, and I guess the line probably, I assume, needs to be drawn somewhere so that um, some there could be a trial period and then, and then another raft of openings. But... It baffles us in the industry, I have to say, because um, particularly our category of gyms, because you know we're at a starting point where we have very large buildings, Aidan's point actually, um, 17,000 square feet, very high ceilings, and they're very highly spec because we typically deal with a lot of people, plus of 100. Now, we won't be looking to put nearly that many people in, but to give you an idea, our Milton Keynes site sucks the air out in 12 minutes flat. So I think that would probably, with no disrespect to my um, fellow panellists in, in hospitality, be a better situation than any, certainly supermarket or cinema or pub. So that's the starting point. We've also quite technology um, it, uh, heavily invested because we run 24 hours and there aren't always staff there. We are staffed, but not at three in the morning, perhaps. And, um, and for that, it gives us the ability to cap the number of people that we have in the gym um, we've got a way of telling people what percentage uh, uh, we're getting so they can make an informed choice. So there are a lot of things. I mean, you know, and, and, and back to the fundamental one, you can't run a gym successfully if it's not clean. So we, we, we have the sort of regimes that my fellow panellists have in place anyway. Now, you increase that and you reduce down the number of people in the gym, um, then you get a very, very safe environment. And, and I would suggest it's safer than 99, I'm afraid, out of 100 pubs You'd be better but off I coming suppose, to the gym. Uh, as a pure amateur and, and not with anybody with any medical knowledge or anything else, yeah. uh, inevitably the idea of coming to your gyms is you're going to get people to exercise, they're going to be breathing heavily. Yeah. Um, so if they've got any uh, symptoms at all, or even if they're asymptomatic but got the virus within them, yeah. the, the thinking is that they would be uh, breathing out these uh, virus spores and then yeah. other people who are also breathing heavily might well breathe them in in a relatively closed space. Is that, is that a, a, a realistic thinking? Uh, that could be how this decision has been made. The reality is quite different. If you've got a building of church size proportions and you're sucking the air out in 12 minutes, I would suggest it's a far safer environment than the one we're sitting in at the moment. So, so, and, and there is no evidence that I can find that sweat, for example, is, is, uh, can, transfers the virus. Um, so I feel that if you, and the key one is we can manage the numbers. You can't, it's much harder in other, in other uh, uh, environments like a supermarket, but we can simply cap the number depending on what we feel. So if you have a 17,000 square foot building and you only allow 10 people in, they're going to be as socially distanced um, as, as, as anywhere. Uh, and taking the air out very, very quickly gives them a, a, a lot of being akin to being outside when you're actually inside. So I feel we're, we're, 
We're, we're baffled, I have to say. And, and the thing is that we, we also have in place, and right down to our smaller, I saw one of the questions from a fellow local gym owner, David Long, if I got his name right, CrossFit, and he mentions his booking system. We've all got booking systems so that we can manage. Uh, and you can't do that at a supermarket. You'll have a crowd of people outside trying to get in. Whereas we can manage people through, and if they're not booked, then they can come off peak. So, so. I imagine there's a huge pent-up demand for gyms out there. People have yeah. not been able to take their proper exercise during this last three months. Yeah. Have you any sort of uh, uh, idea what are you, when are you planning that you might be able to get over? Out, S uh, open, sorry. You so might to open. I would be very disappointed if we don't follow pubs within a couple of weeks. Um, so mid-July. Um, what we don't know, and I don't, think, I don't think any of us know, is the percentage of people who are going to come back. We're going to be, you know, there will be some who, who will be nervous. We, I think as a species in our DNA, we're contagion, uh, can, you know, like rats and spiders and, other, and snakes and things. It, it, there is a, a weariness. Now, I feel we need to, to step over that and we need to get back in business because um, I've calculated that for every month we're shut, it'll take a year to recover from that. So... Um, it's, it's, we have to balance, you know, if I suppose this, you know, the fundamental, uh, if you were an economist, you would say open everything. If you're a doctor saying preserve lives, you would, you know, so it's a this question of getting the middle. Isn't it? The government's got to take. Balance, exactly. I'm going to ask all the others, uh, but, uh, but the common to all of your business is your dedicated staff. Yeah. Um, uh, how, have you been in touch with them? How are they doing? Are they furloughed and are they raring to come back in, in, in all of them or how is it work? What was the, what's the feeling? Yeah, all, all furloughed um, and we're, we're revving up to come back as soon as we are able to open. Um, we've had time to think through. It's, I think it's mostly getting your strategy right is, is the most important thing because if you're doing silly, superfluous safety things where the perception is high but the reality is low, I'm, I don't really subscribe to those. So the sorts of things we've got in place, uh, which I can talk you through, I feel um, are the ones that will... And actually implementing those is not... So you're not worried about getting sufficient staff back? N not at this point. I think they have, they're having a wonderful time because they're 80% they're paid and they can, they can do lots of other... You know, they can paint their houses and enjoy the sunshine. So they seem happy. Uh, the test will be uh, with the date that they're asked to come back. Maybe none of them will come back. But I, I sense that they, they uh, are with us on, uh, on Great. this. Great. Aidan, I'm going to come to you first. Aidan? Uh, because you've got a lot of staff of various different um, skills and abilities. Are you in touch with, are your staff all furloughed and are you in touch with them? And are you confident they're going to come back? Uh, maybe they are all back now cleaning and doing all the other jobs. Uh, tell us about your staff. Yeah, so, I, I mean, yeah, so the uh, st staff team is about 40, 40 odd people, um, all furloughed. Um, the plan is to start to bring people back mostly from next Wednesday. I think one, one of the challenges which will be sort of unique to sort of hotels as opposed to pubs and restaurants is that I'm not expecting that, you know, we open the doors on the 4th and then business will show up. I think for us, given that we, we have a certain amount of, say, um, corporate midweek travel, I, I think it's, it's going to be a number of months before we actually fully recover. So I think, I think we'll be taking advantage of the furlough scheme for, you know, literally all the way up to the end of October before we can really bring all the team back. Um, as far as I can tell, the vast majority are, are pretty much looking forward to getting back. I mean, I, I think a lot of them have been sat at home, actually fairly bored. So I think, I think most are raring to get going again. So I'm going to come to then Rob and Jason. I mean, these type of hospitality businesses are very dependent on your staff. Rob, have you been in touch with your staff? And are you confident you're going to get them back uh, when you reopen? Yeah, I think I can... Uh, you know, agree with what, what, what Aidan said, you know, a lot of the, um, most of, yeah, everyone just seems very keen to just get back to work, get back to whatever, whatever the next stage is. So uh, really encouraging um, noises from, from all of the staff. And, and actually, you know, many, many staff are already back. Like I said, lots of places already operating as takeaway. Sally Pussies has been very busy as a takeaway. The old prison in North Leach, we've got four different kind of operations that are going to be launching there, including an outside retail market, outside bar, an outside chicken shop, uh, including the existing cafe uh, that you will all know from the old prison in North Leach. So, you know, everyone's been pretty busy getting everything geared up and trying to get um, everything ready. And also we did lots of um, work for Food for Heroes at the beginning, 500 meals 
every week for Cheltenham Hospital, Gloucester Hospital, delivering those, cooking them, chilling the meals down. Now we're doing open kitchens, cooking another 500 meals this Monday to go to uh, Gloucester. Um, uh, so, yeah, we've been, we've been pretty busy. Uh, well done. Jason, you've obviously employed a lot of staff. Um, have you been in touch with them? Are they furloughed? Are they going to come back? Yeah, I mean, uh, probably the same as Rob. You know, we I think our sector, I'm really proud of, we've really took um, a responsible position on our community um, commitment. So like Rob, you know, we've done a shop um, which kept people away from supermarkets. So, you know, we, we've, we've actively done volunteering. We've actively provided services for our community in, in, um, in Ampney and in Sirencester. We've done whatever we can. So the honesty is our local colleagues have, have never left. We've, they've carried on working, whether it's through volunteering, some are furloughed, some are unfurloughed. We've got 500 colleagues across all of our hospitality businesses. Um, the, the one area that I think we're worried about, particularly in inner London, is more to do with the international colleagues. Now the flights have started to open, are actually getting on planes and going overseas. And it's whether they come back. So I think it's been very hard on those colleagues. And like this call today, Zoom calls, we've kept daily with our senior management and weekly with our, our sort of more variable, flexible colleagues. We've done regular communication and updates and I think companies that have done that will vote better than the ones that are, that are going to try and open on the fourth when colleagues have been at home for 100 days not working just physically to build your stock levels get the past the you know the beer in the cellar we think there's going to be a shortage there um you know how you supply a shortage a pub a pub with no beer how can how can we have this well you know there's an estimated a uh, government report that's come out saying that the estimate, I think this is a bit ambitious personally, but they're saying three billion of sales um, in that first weekend. We know that the brewers only started brewing beer last week. Right. The other can, can, problem. Can, can, can I, I, I want to just move you on uh, to the lot because we're yeah, running fine. out of time. The last question, which I want to ask you all. We've had an incident in Tetbury fairly recently where a, a pub landlord, I think, uh, uh, offered to sell a pint of beer to somebody. And within uh, 20 minutes, there were 40 people there. That, that pub has never seen 40 people queuing for beer. What sort, I, 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 in the happy event that all of your businesses get a huge surge of people, how are you going to control this and how are you going to work out your supplies? Just the, what you were just talking about there. I'll keep with you, Jason, if I may, then I'll come round all the others for the last time. Um, Pre-booking. Pre uh, Pre-odd, we've, we've been communicating now for two weeks uh, that we're going to go for the fourth. Uh, we're hoping that the uh, bill gets passed tomorrow, uh, sorry, on Monday, on the 29th of June. It's still not been formally passed. We're assuming that that's the case. So we've actually started a waiting list. So we know what we've got coming in. We've been working with our suppliers for the last three weeks to make sure that we've got stock and we've got beer. Um, and that we're ready to go, and we've been fully Jason, audited. I'm going to have to cut you off there. I'm going to have to cut you yeah. off there because we're short of time. Um, uh, um, Mark, you've been sitting there very patiently. Your staff have a particularly difficult job because they're going to be working well outside their comfort zone to make sure all the surfaces are clean and uh, between each each lot of guests, and as you say, removing all these various things. Uh, how are your 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 staff going to cope? Uh, and 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 uh, do you think? I mean, you're probably in a different situation to the others. Do you think that the demand will come back quite quickly for your holiday lets? Uh, how are you going to cope with all of that? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly one that will be drinking the beer that they'll be serving. I, oh, I good. Don't, I don't serving any? Um, yeah, it, it's our staff have been great. Um, we've, there's only a small team, eight of us. We've been having Zoom calls regularly, and I think that's been vital to make them all feel included. We've already got two back full-time, including me, three full-time. We're going to take advantage of the part-time furlough in July, which is great, because I think we will have a bit of a, a lead into this. But it's almost full for July, August, we've got a lot. the last few weeks, certainly since the date was announced, it's been absolutely manic on the booking front. So 
I think people, there's a pent up demand, but they're going to come and stay. Fantastic. Your sound is not great, but we've got the gist of most of that. Uh, Rob, um, how are you going to cope with, are you going to do like Jason and have some sort of booking system to avoid a massive sort of, uh, pe a lot of people queuing outside, or what are you going to do? Yeah, for, for those restaurants where we're going to do table service, they'll be putting a booking system in. And other than that, it's just having have your risk assessment in place, have your control measures in place, make sure you communicate to all the staff and customers, which is always the most challenging thing, making sure the customer actually understands what they're doing when they come to your establishment and uh, you know what the flow is. Um, uh, you know, have your measures in place, stick to them, and then it's just training. Uh, and then it'll be it'll be absolutely fine. Thank yeah. you. And Aidan, um, you've got lots of different bits to the hotel. Are you anticipating that the bar and the restaurant are going to come back quicker than the hotel side? Uh, is that what your sort of thinking is? Very, very much so. Um, unfortunately, I think I think the the bar and restaurant side. I think we we could be in a position where it could actually sort of build up quite nicely in the next you know, four, four weeks. I mean, we've not had an established business there. So I think for us, we're almost like a new market entrance into this. So I think for us, that will definitely come back very nicely in the next four weeks. The bedroom side, we have a smattering, a tiny smattering of bookings throughout July and August. I think realistically by September, October, November, I think I think we'll be doing absolutely fantastic in terms of the staycation market. Once 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 people begin to be comfortable with the idea of going, going for an overnight stay, Without without having gone away in the summer, I think I think there's a massive opportunity for the staycation market as we come towards the uh, you know Q3 part of the year. Thank you, thank you. And finally, uh, Rupert, I mean, you're hoping to open in a fortnight's time. Yeah. Um, would you anticipate that literally when you open your doors, you're going to get a surge in demand? Are you going to have a booking system? What what are you actually planning for? Um, it's the million dollar question because honestly, we don't know whether it's going to be 20% coming back on day one or 80%. And I couldn't tell you with any confidence. But so our plan is to is to cater for both those. Now, um, there is no point in having a booking system for us to to, to for, for a slot if we're at 20% because we'll have plenty of space. If we're 80%, then clearly we do. So our view is to have a booking system ready, tested, working, and introduce it just for the peak time. Because actually, for 20 hours of the day, uh, we can cope quite happily with the number of people that we, we uh, feel we want to have in there. But for the peak time, then, then we'll be able to swiftly add a booking system so people are not waiting, which causes problems in itself. And it's not, it's not straightforward, by the way, because um, people cancel and don't show up, people are human, they, want, they don't want that exact hour. So we, we've gone through all of those and we've got what we feel is a good, safe, balanced approach. Thank you very much. Can I thank all of our panel very much indeed. It's been a really interesting discussion. Uh, may I wish you all the best of possible luck. We need you to open successfully. Your customers want you to open successfully and your staff want to enjoy working for you uh, uh, again and seeing the business is open. So good luck and thank you all very, very much for coming on the panel today. It's been really interesting. David, open to you. Thank you, Sir Geoffrey. Um, just building on that, um, Questions coming in from the live stream as usual. Um, we've got questions from last week, not education related because they obviously have been passed on to you through Rock the Cotswolds, or there are one or two. Uh, just to kill off a couple of things, if I may quickly. Um, Rita, uh, you very kindly have thanked Jason for the takeaway coffee and the delicious cake at <laughs> Ah, Andy, there you Andy are, Jason. Cruces, and if you're your still staff. listening, that's great. So, well done, Jason. Uh, well, great coffee and great cake at Anthony Cruces. I'm sure there's great coffee and cake at all the venues that we were um, talking to earlier. Other quick questions I'd like to deal with, if I may. We always get people who um, are positive. We get some comments that are slightly negative. Um, um, Anna Greco and Steve Jones, you seem to be a bit concerned that uh, Rupert Mackenzie Hill runs gyms that are not based in uh, the Cotswolds. Um, this is not a programme about uh, health and fitness, because I know we're going to tackle that on a future occasion. What we felt would be useful today in discussing it uh, before the meeting was to have venues that were opening and a venue or an organisation that wasn't able to open just to highlight the problems that were going forward. For everybody's benefit, whilst Kiss Jim's nearest venue is in uh, Swindon, as Rupert said, Rupert lives uh, in the water park and well, runs his business in Sirencester. Let's ask him, are you, are, in the future, might you open a gym in the Cotswolds? Uh, would love to. Been eyeing up Sirencester for, for some time. So okay. He's walked to the office because, walked to here because his office is just up the road. We've got to keep going. Yeah, okay, right. Just quickly, and thanks again, Rupert, for coming on. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
A uh, question from last week from Rob Cookson. A um, bit concerned about inter-party fighting and politicians uh, having a go at each other. Uh, this suggestion that perhaps we would have better benefited from a national government or a government of national unity. Um, I don't know if you'd like to comment on that. I think we've moved forward with the support of uh, the other parties very effectively. Well, I think just with very, very briefly, Robert, um, good to hear from you. Um, I think that this has been an unprecedented situation with this pandemic for over a century. Um, we've all been learning as we've gone along. I think on the whole, the government has done as well as it could have done in the circumstances. And I think the really great achievement was at one point we thought we were going to get several hundred thousand deaths and that the NHS was going to be completely overwhelmed. We managed to avoid that, keep the NHS functioning properly and the number of deaths although sad, uh, was not as bad as it was first thought it was going to be. Thank you. Question from uh, Rachel at Teatro, um, just across the space from here. We are reopening like everybody else on Saturday the 4th, predominantly outside, and have planned to have uh, a live piano in the garden. We were having a solo act on the piano a large distance away from the customers and staff and have also put a perspex screen up. When the guidance came through, it said no live performance of music. We took this to mean outside and inside. However, we are aware of some venues, not uh, necessarily in Sirencester, um, I would add, that have um, taken a slightly different interpretation and are still on planning to have live music outside. Do you have any uh, clarity I, that you I, can I, bring I, to I, it, I, I don't, but a little bit of common sense, maybe. I think the, the thought from the people who are writing the guidelines is that if you have music and you have alcohol, people will then perhaps start to uh, drop their guard on how to behave sensibly. So what I would do, advise uh, our questioner here, is to open and then just see how it goes, and then if it looks as though it's going to be all right, then slowly introduce live music, but just for the time being, be a little bit cautious. Well, that's a, a lovely feed into a question um, from CrossFit gyms in Sirencester, uh, who Rupert mentioned earlier. Can you please ask why indoor gyms are still not allowed to open? Well, we've kind of addressed well, I think that. we've covered yep. that hugely. Yeah. But what's interesting, the point he would like to leave us with is that um, when people have gone to a pub and had a drink, perhaps they're not as socially aware uh, and as they would be going into the pub and that we should be mindful of that. And I know that you and the owners of gyms and health and fitness businesses are keen to reopen safely as soon as possible. Well, I think that the, the key message here has got to be to every one of us, stay alert. What we don't want to do is start a massive increase in the virus again. So each one of us has a duty to our fellow citizens and ourselves to, to, to act sensibly. Just a very quick question from a lady who uh, tried to get the question in um, uh, last week and again uh, this week. It's to do with shops now opening. It seems very odd that swimming pools cannot be reopened. I'm thinking in particular somewhere like the Leisure Centre at Morton in the Marsh. Uh, change rooms are very large and roomy. We could operate a, build, uh, a, a booking system and swimming um, is an immersion activity. So possibly people will be safer. Any news that you can give? I think you've just got the same information that Rupert's got. Yes, I mean, I think, again, on swimming pools, it's a bit like gyms. The poor Public Health England have been inundated by uh, different categories wanting to reopen as quickly as possible. I think it's partly that we want to have a phased reopening of, of all the facilities, but also I think there's individual risks. We've talked about the individual risks in the gyms. There's individual risks, I think, in swimming pools, not least of which people inadvertently getting quite quite close to each other when they're getting in and out of the swimming pool, uh, not through, through, through just you know, excitement of getting into the water. So I think just be a little patient. I think as with the gyms, I suspect it won't be too long before swimming pools will be able to be open. Quick comment on last week, um, Sir Geoffrey from Jack Stevens said that most of the questions um, from the panel of Rock the Cotswolds and from teachers um, were directed at the government about lack of funding and clear guidance. Um, what have you as our MP been doing about this? Well, I think you've done a hell of a lot. Um, I mean, just to say, you heard in my opening remarks today, just uh, 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 not, I wouldn't say solely as a result of my question to the Prime Minister, but certainly reinforced by my question, a billion pounds the government has now announced for this catch-up programme for all children to catch up on the education they've missed during the coronavirus. So, yes, I've been extraordinarily active during this period uh, with some successful results. 
Richard Harrison sent in a question to do with schools and the whole issue of um, levels of ventilation. I'm going to suggest that that question is added to the Rockwell Cotswolds question, yeah. question list because it's to do specifically with uh, schools. I will raise this, Richard, with, um, on my uh, so call, health call with the, with the, call, with the health, chief health uh, people and the county council later this evening. Uh, what's going to happen with testing next year? Will Year 6 be expected to sit SATs when they will have large gaps in the curriculum? Again, I think that question could be dealt with um, Yes, separately. I think it's From changed. Ed Stone. Yes, I, I'd like Ed to Stone. just actually answer that in writing because I think it has changed. The thinking has changed a bit on this. Okay. One from Rosemary Andrews, one of our regular contributors. Um, if children could be tested to see if they're carrying antibodies, might that not help and enable us to have children um, in school without having to worry about bubbles? So it's about testing with children. Would you like to take that one up with the relevance? Well, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, we've now got a, a huge uh, testing facility in um, uh, Gloucester. We're about to get one in the Cotswolds, I hope, and I think it will be easier uh, to get um, people tested. At the moment, it's really aimed at people who've got symptoms, but it may well be that once the capacity of the laboratories and the testing is up and running, we may be able to extend it more widely. And I agree, Rosemary, it would be a good thing if we could test children on a more regular basis. Uh, I'm not... Uh, uh, but, but whatever happens, we need to get schools back in September safely. Richard Harrison is also talking about testing in relation to children. And again, bearing in mind, you'd like to get through all the Bit questions. Worried about time. We'll, we'll, we'll deal yeah. with that question um, in a minute. Sorry, uh, outside this uh, yeah. event. Um, right, just a couple of other questions that have come in this morning, um, if I may. We need to move, I think. We do, and I'm just trying to get them, if you bear with me, Geoffrey, the technology. Right. Uh, interesting talking about um, gatherings that have taken place from Nick Hughes and a similar question from Rosemary Andrews. Uh, seen students around the area who are having gatherings and when reported to the police nothing seems to, nothing seems to happen. Um, he's talking about 12 people in one house near where he obviously lived who were having a barbecue reported this to the police. I'm not saying he did but it was reported so to So I'll the take this as the last question. Right. Um, I have seen uh, gatherings of people and uh, clearly the police are in quite a difficult, particularly on the beaches and so on, and the Prime Minister has made it quite clear that unless we continue to follow the guidelines, some of these facilities may well have to be closed. So it's in everybody's interest that actually we behave with respect to our fellow citizens, we observe the guidelines closely in order to make sure we don't get another spike of this disease because that would be devastating for us all individually but particularly to all these businesses that have been so patient waiting to, to open and with huge economic damage. We certainly don't want to cause another lockdown even locally or nationally. So I would appeal to all our listeners Please behave with caution and stay alert. Could I, this isn't a question, but it's a suggestion, just to leave at this point, Sir Geoffrey, and the other one or two questions which can be dealt with outside this meeting. It's a suggestion from Jonathan Rook, who's a local PR man. Many are saying that the lockdown is for ending far too early. With the public divided on the issue of whether to end or that we should consider a quick poll, perhaps in the form of a national referendum, uh, which has worked well in the past, should we stay in or should we go out? For goodness I, sake, <laughs> we've had enough referendums. Wasn't right. the Brexit referendum divisive enough? Yeah. Let's get on getting this country back to work and get moving beyond the virus. Okay. We don't want to fiddle around with referendums. Right. Just to hand back to you, Chevy, with one, one no, last... No, no, I think we've had enough. Right. But we've had enough. We need to move on to the final bits of the show. Okay. Uh, right. Question. Right. Qu West, my Westminster update. For more information on any of the following announcements, please go to the coronavirus website, www.gov.uk forward spoke coronavirus. And as I've said many times before, there is an extensive amount of information and guidance available on the website with frequently asked question page with all the updated guidance on lockdown. The UK COVID-19 alert level has been reduced from level 4 to level 3, showing that we've made good progress against the virus, thanks to the efforts of all you, the public. And please don't let's lose that, uh, that advantage that we've gained. And as I discussed last week, I visited the New Hempstead Meadow coronavirus testing site in Gloucester. 
I was impressed by the army of people supervising the testing with relatively known numbers requiring tests when I visited. For anyone who has symptoms, you can book online. It's a very simple procedure. Please don't hesitate to go and get tested if you remotely think you might be contracting the virus. And I've also been working on a mobile testing site for the Cotswolds with a potential site identified in Borton on the Water. This will make access to this testing a lot easier for this very big area. The Health Secretary has announced plans to ease restrictions for millions of people who are shielding so that they can spend more time outside their homes and with loved ones from the end of next week. From Saturday the 1st of August, the guidance will be relaxed so that clinically extremely vulnerable people will no longer be advised to shield, but support will remain, including from the NHS volunteers and local councils. And people who have shielded will still be able to access priority supermarket delivery slots and other help. But I would just say in passing, for those that are extremely vulnerable, please continue to exercise extra caution. In Gloucestershire, the majority of reception year one and year six children are back in primary schools. Students in years 10 and 12 in secondary schools facing exams next year are returning to school in small cohorts. And following my question to the Prime Minister last week, one billion pounds will be provided for a COVID catch-up plan which will help head teachers provide extra support to children who have fallen behind while they've been out of school during these last three months. 350 million will be put towards high quality tuition for the most disadvantaged children. This will help accelerate their progress and prevent the educational attainment gap from widening. That, I'm afraid, is the end of our show. We've run out of time. It's the end of our weekly series of shows, but please continue to follow us and we will be with you again within the month. Thank you very much for tuning in all these months and I hope you found it enjoyable and informative. <laughs>